much for inviting me. Can everyone hear okay in the back? Um, I'm going to talk about some work that we have been doing with um, SRI International and AMU um, on clarification and spoken dialogue systems. And I first want to acknowledge my colleagues at Columbia who have been working on this. Um, but we're also working with a much larger team, uh, some of whom are in this very room. So they will know what I'm going to be talking about. And you can correct any errors that I might make. <laughs> so as all of you know, I'm sure, um, speech recognition and spoken dialogue systems um, is very full of errors. Um, we just looked at a couple of systems that we've been working with, in particular the TransTAC speech recognition, speech to speech translation system. Um, the English side makes about 9% errors. And in a deployed system, this is CMU's Let's Go system, uh, the errors are actually much more frequent. This is in a, a system that's actually being used in Pittsburgh to tell bus information after 5 o'clock at night. So how do speech recognition systems currently handle errors? Well, not very, uh, uh, not very much like humans do. They usually use, as you know, a measure of confidence in the hypothesis, a combination of acoustic model <coughs> likelihood and also of language model posterior probability to score a recognition hypothesis and decide whether it's correct or not. And when they believe that they have misrecognized an utterance, what do they do? Uh, for example, um, I was just trying this out with my uh, <laughs> not very reliable iPhone, uh, talking to Siri, and I said, call Andrew Lane, and I have multiple Andrews in my um, contact list. And it says, I don't understand, call Andrew Lane, but would you like me to search the web for it? Which might have been useful. <laughs> I suppose Andrew is actually on the web. Um, but more typically, a system will say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Could you please repeat? Or perhaps, could you please rephrase what you've said? So this is very different from the way human beings handle similar errors when they don't understand. So if I said um, to someone, call Andrew Lane, please, like my secretary, um, she might say, if she didn't quite understand the name, you want to call who, or whom do you want to call, or more likely, who do you want to call? Or if she is being more cooperative, which Andrew of the people you know do you want to call? Now these uh, questions have been studied by Matthew Perver in a 2004 dissertation, and he calls them reprise clarification questions. And the characteristic of such clarification questions, which typify in about 88% humans do this kind of behavior, these are targeted questions that, first of all, convey to the hearer what the person has heard of the misrecognized utterance or what they believe they have heard, and then targets just a question about what they have not heard. So we'll see some examples of this in a minute. So the outline of my talk, and I hope I'll be able to get through all of this in the time allotted, um, is first I'm going to tell you what we're doing to build a dialogue manager for speech-to-speech -speech translation, because you may wonder, why do you need a dialogue manager in speech-to-speech -speech translation? Then I'll mainly focus on data collection that we have been doing to support our work in creating these kinds of targeted clarification questions, because they're non-trivial to create. Then I'll talk about a few classification experiments, and then I'll tell you about our future research. So the goal of our research is to study human-human strategies for communication, for clarification. Um, in a speech-to-speech -speech translation system, which is currently, I believe, called Thunderbolt. Um, and what we want to do is two things. First of all, we want to identify the errors that, for humans, do not seem to require clarification at all. Because there's no point in clarifying something if you can basically figure out what the person wanted without getting every single word right. 
And then we want to identify clarification strategies for those errors that really do require clarification. So on the one hand, we want to know when to clarify, and on the other hand, we want to know how to clarify in a more human-like manner when we do need to. We want to develop methods to detect local errors with high accuracy. And we've been working on that, as well as our colleagues at UW and also now at AMU. Uh, and we, our goal is to create a dialogue manager that can ask appropriate questions, but just uh, when it needs to. So clarification in the speech-to-speech -speech translation system, why do we need to do this and what do we do? So a speech-to-speech -speech translation system of the sort we're working on in the BOLT project has to support unrestricted conversation. It can be about anything, really, although typically it tends to be about more military matters, um, or at least things of interest in the field, <laughs> we think. Um, but you need to support a conversation between two people who do not speak each other's languages. Um, so Thunderbolt supports this kind of speech-to-speech -speech translation by first doing speech recognition and then doing machine translation on the output of the speech recognizer between American English and Iraqi Arabic. And so the dialogue manager's job in this particular type of system is to identify potential um, errors in the ASR input or to take such information from our partners who are working on error analysis and then to try to clarify these before we pass along the transcription, hopefully then corrected, to the machine translation system. So this was the original speech-to-speech -speech translation system that we started working with. As you can see, you have a speaker of one language speaking into uh, an automatic speech recognition system, and then the transcript is being tr uh, passed along to the machine translation, and then that goes eventually to the Iraqi speaker, in this case, who then speaks, and the same process goes back to English. So what we've done in this new version of the system is to introduce a dialogue manager that actually tries to do some clarification sub-dialogues, gets input on what the likely errors are, and it tries to figure out what should we do with that kind of input. So we've introduced something between the person and the translation system that tries to figure out if there are errors, and if so, what we should do about it. So we have a corpus of speech from the original system, <laughs> the speech-to-speech -speech translation system, which was pretty errorful because it didn't have this kind of clarify, well, we think, because it didn't have this kind of clarification component. And so there were lots and lots of mistakes made that were never actually caught before they went to machine translation. The data that we're using for our experiments was collected during seven months of evaluation of this initial speech-to-speech -speech translation system. And this is a sample dialogue. This one actually, I think, was correctly recognized, where uh, the English speaker says, good morning. That's translated to the Iraqi speakers. Iraqi speaker replies, good morning, in Iraqi Arabic, which I cannot produce. And it goes back and forth. And I mean, you can kind of see that these are rather strange conversations. Uh, the English speaker says, may I speak to the head of the household? The Arabic speaker says, I'm the owner of the family. You can tell the translation here at work. Um, and I can speak with you. May I speak to you about problems with your utilities? Yes, I have problems with the utilities. So this was a successful conversation in this particular environment. So we're going to use um, data of this sort, but data which actually contains recognition errors for the purposes of our study. So here's what we did. Um, this was our, our goal was to collect a corpus of human responses to automatic speech recognition errors. So we wanted to see what would people do to clarify these errors and try to figure out what was really, um, what was really intended. 
So we're going to use um, data of the sort I just showed you, but with recognition errors, and these are real errors in the data. And we're going to ask, um, do some crowdsourcing and ask people uh, who are Turkers who work in uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk some questions about these errors to try to elicit human performance. So our data was almost a thousand utterances from this TransTAC corpus, and each of them contain um, either a single ASR error or a single segment of errors. So we're looking not only at one word errors, but of contiguous errors that might be a phrase. And as you might imagine, it's much more difficult to clarify errors which contain multiple words in a segment. It's easier to ask about one word errors. So we're going to replace the errors in the transcripts with XXX, which just means I don't understand this, or this is something that's not intelligible. So if the um, soldier said, do you own a gun? Uh, and gun is misrecognized in the corpus, we would say, give the Turkers this phrase, do you own a XXX? Okay, so is it clear what we're doing? And we want to see what people do when they're given things like this. So we asked uh, three Turkers to answer a series of questions about these kinds of sentences that have either one error in them or several words that are together as an error, okay? So these are the questions that we ask people. So for example, how many blank doors does this garage have? Who can fill in the blank? What would you think? I realize many of you are not native speakers of English, but anyhow, give it a shot. Back, hmm? Back. Back doors does this garage have? Mm -hmm. Could be. Any other? Hmm? Green doors, <laughs> open doors, <laughs> secure doors. <laughs> yeah, I think in, in this case it was how many, um, oh, I think this was how many front doors. Do you remember? I don't know. <laughs> how many, it could have been how many secure doors. This is a hard one to guess, right? <laughs> So what we would ask the Turkers, as I'm asking you, is the meaning of the sentence clear to you despite the missing word? How many would say yes? I don't think so. Uh, what do you think the missing word could be? And if people couldn't guess, they couldn't guess, they could leave it blank. It wasn't forced choice. What type of information did you think was missing? Now, how many people could answer that one? By that I mean, well, we didn't say what was the part of speech of the word that was missing because they would not maybe know what we meant. So we gave them examples. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Is it an adverb? Is it a preposition? And people generally understood what we meant by that. So what type of information do you guys think was missing? <laughs> what? Probably an adjective, yes. People were pretty good at guessing. It could have been like a noun noun compound, right? If you heard this sen sentence in a conversation, would you just continue with the conversation or would you stop and ask a question? Probably stop and ask a question. Um, and if you answered stop to ask what the mi missing word is, what question would you ask? So what question would you ask? Anybody? What kind of doors? Right. All right. So here's a sample question. Do you own a, complete the sentence please, Nicoletta, do you own a, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> you, now you're going to say, but you might want some context, but quite honestly, these conversations did not have a lot of context that was reliable. So in this case, it was a hard hat. <laughs> this would be pretty hard to guess. Okay, so, um, do you own a hard hat? The Turker guesses, first of all, you know, they're asked to guess the word itself, and they're also asked to get guess something which is the part of speech of a word. 
what type of information is missing. So um, two of them had no idea. One of them guessed house. We have no idea why this person <laughs> guessed house. But everyone guessed that it was a noun, right? So people were good at guessing the part of speech, not so good at guessing what that part of speech was in this case. So these are the proposed questions that they would have given for clarification. Do I own a what? The second one thought that he already knew what the answer was, so he didn't bother to answer a question. And the other, do I have a what? So these are targeted clarification questions. How long have the villagers blank on the farm for? Anybody? Hmm? Lived? Been? Worked? <laughs> You're not allowed to guess. <laughs> so in fact, it was worked. And the Turkers' guesses were worked. I don't know what was wrong with this guy. <laughs> How long had their villagers? <laughs> We tried to make sure they were all native speakers of standard American English, but you can't always be sure. <laughs> so uh, lived, worked are pretty reasonable guesses. And no one thought they needed to ask a question, because even if maybe they weren't so sure about, well, I guess they all thought they could tell, um, but even if they were very wrong about it, they felt that they didn't need to ask a clarification question in this case. So here's a summary of the user guesses as to the actual word and the part of speech of the missing word. And what you'll see is, first of all, they were guessing the correct word about 35% overall of cases. Uh, they guessed the part of speech tag in 58%, which was somewhat better than the actual word, not surprisingly. And they're likely to guess a noun part of speech correctly, but note, when they guess that it's a noun, they have very low accuracy when they guess what actual noun is involved. So if you look at just the things that are different here, if it's a WH word, they're pretty good at guessing not only that it is, but also what the actual word is. Reasonably good at guessing the prepositions, but content words like adverbs, adjectives, they're actually pretty good with verbs, but nouns they're very, very bad at. So I think this is kind of similar to the experience of you all in a few examples that I've given. So for here's some possible user strategies that we saw in the data. Um, for a sample input, like make sure you close the blank behind the vehicle. How many people? can guess what blank was? It was door. Reasonable. Um, they could either continue without asking a question. They could stop and ask a question. And if they chose to stop and ask a question, then our question is, what type of question did they ask? Did they ask something like, what did you say? Or I didn't hear you? Or a confirmation question. Did you mean close the door? Or a reprise clarification question, what needs to be closed behind the vehicle? And this was the distribution. In almost two thirds of the cases, they felt like they didn't need to stop and ask a question at all. That was kind of surprising to us. Um, since our goal was to create these nice, human-like targeted clarification questions, it was a little discouraging to find that actually we should be focusing on trying to figure out how people were able to sort of automatically correct the error output for themselves rather than engaging in a clarification dialogue. But in about 40% of the cases, they said they would stop and ask a question. And so at least those cases we need to be able to deal with in a better way. All right, so here are some of the sample clarification questions they asked, and they're pretty reasonable. Um, do you have anything other than these blank plans? What plans? What else can blank do if the vehicle don't stop? <laughs> That's a hard one. What kind of question? Hmm. 
some of these are very, very hard to come up with a good question about, and you can sort of see why people would say, huh, <laughs> or I don't understand. <laughs> um, blank, your neighbor reported the theft. Which neighbor? That's pretty reasonable. Do you desire to blank services to this new clinic to do what about services? It's a little harder to construct some of those. So here this uh, distribution of when people preferred to not ask a question, to go ahead and continue, what was the part of speech? So what kinds of parts of speech did people feel like they could just fill in for themselves? And not surprisingly, if we look at this, um, they chose to continue if the missing word they thought was a preposition or a question word um, or actually an action verb, and that surprised us a lot. They didn't seem to need to, they could fill in the action verbs, like go, come, arrive. Um, <coughs> pronouns they were pretty good on, or they thought they were pretty good on. Adverbs less so, and if we get down into the nouns and the adjectives, then they're gonna uh, feel like they have to stop and ask a question. And so it pretty much divides into function words versus content words, except for the action verbs. That was a surprising result to us, that people were pretty good at, at least they thought they were pretty good at filling those in. So what types of questions, when they did ask a question, were the most frequent ones? So we said about 40% of the time, they do say we need to stop and ask a question, and in most of those cases, it was a reprise clarification question. They could come up with a reprise clarification question. So this suggests to us that our uh, strategy or our goal of trying to create these questions and ask them in the dialogue manager is probably, a, it confirms Perver's um, findings. So again, this is just a distribution of the parts of speech that were guessed and the type of question that was asked. And so on the one hand you see um, that the nouns and adjectives over here, they tended to ask reprise clarification questions, but the function words over here, um, they didn't know how to ask or this is my hypothesis, it's really difficult. If you think that a question word is missing and you choose to ask a question about that, how do you do it? <coughs> so if you think that, you know, I said uh, something about X ate the cookies with rising intonation, <coughs> what would you say? I mean, either you would fill in who, <laughs> or if you thought that animals could eat the cookies, <laughs> you might fill in what, but how, it, how do you ask a targeted question about something like that? It's really hard. The other type of missing word part of speech that is very hard to ask one of these targeted questions about is a preposition. How do you ask what preposition, you could say, what preposition word did you mean to use here? <laughs> but that might be, require a little too much thinking. Okay. So in about two thirds of the cases, people thought they could answer they could process the errorful input without asking a question. In about three quarters of the cases, when they did think they would stop and ask a question, it was one of these reprise clarification questions. So we'd say, so our conclusions are that people prefer to ask these targeted clarification questions, especially for missing content words. They find it hard to create these reprise questions when the missing word is something like a function word, a WH word, or a preposition, but they were pretty good at inferring, or they thought they were pretty good at inferring what the missing preposition was uh, or what the missing action verb was, and they didn't tend to ask as many questions as we thought they would. So the question is, can spoken dialogue systems actually model this kind of behavior. What does it require? First of all, you need to identify the locations of the error um, with very high precision. Because if you ask one of these targeted clarification questions, remember that 
these questions include not only what you think you have recognized correctly, but then they target what you think you haven't recognized. And if what you have recognized correct, have recognized is itself incorrect, and you're trying to ask this sort of human-like question, it sounds very silly and people probably totally lose faith in your system. So it's, it's bad to make a mistake when you're trying to be more like a human being. So we need to identify the error locations. We need to be able to infer the part of speech of the missing word so that we can model what a human being would do if it's a function word versus a content word. And we may need to hypothesize the real word or compose appropriate uh, clarification questions. So I'll tell you a little bit about some experiments predicting user behavior, again, based on the same corpus that we collected. How could we predict, how could we classify what a user would do in this, these particular cases? So one thing we wanted to do was figure out um, when is a person going to continue and when will they stop and ask a question? And you probably all already know the answer to this question. It's heavily dependent on the part of speech of the missing word. So to just um, turn our data into binary classifications, we said if a majority of the Turkers chose to ask a question, we would la label the misrecognized utterance as stop and ask a question. Otherwise, it would be continue. And then for the other experiments, if at least one Turker decided to ask a reprise clarification question, we would label that something you could ask a targeted clarification question about. And there, these are the p uh, features that we used in the classification. So <coughs> the position of the error word, because it seemed to us, just looking at the data, that if the error word was early in the uh, sentence, the utterance, it seemed a little bit harder to guess. Uh, the part of speech, we <coughs> used not only what the user's guess was, but also the automatically um, tagged part of speech using the Stanford tagger. Uh, we used some n-grams and some bigrams, and some bigrams and trigrams of the part of speech tag, so we have a little bit of syntactic information. We also used dependency tags, um, and we also had some semantic role labels that we got from the uh, Senna semantic role labeler parser. So here are the results. This was, uh, can we predict when the user is going to stop and ask a question versus when they're going to uh, continue? And the majority class here is continue without asking a question. And so if we just use the part of speech guesses even of the <coughs> users, we can predict pretty well, um, almost as well as if we use all of those features. And we had <coughs> pretty much similar results for the uh, automatically assigned part of speech tagger as well. So this suggests at least we can figure out when a human being would choose to continue versus stop and ask a question. Uh, what we can do about that is another matter. Um, <coughs> and this was just some um, additional uh, um, Right, we were trying to decide which of the various features was most helpful, and the all speakers, all features, when we um, left out the semantic features, it didn't seem to make very much difference, uh, but when we left out the part of speech features, it made a huge difference. So again, this just confirms our understanding, our belief that part of speech information is really important. Um, then here we're predicting a collective decision. Uh, to stop or to continue, and here again, basically, we can improve somewhat over the baseline, but part of speech information, this is automatically identified is pretty important. Um, now here's a different one. We're going to look at uh, when is it possible for people to ask one of these targeted clarification questions. And this is just, you know, when can somebody come up with a targeted clarification question? And the majority uh, baseline is 
not coming up with a targeted clarification question because that includes all behavior even when people decided not to stop and ask a question. We can improve slightly over the baseline. And again, part of speech information is really important. Um, and this is just a similar kind of result. So the conclusion that we uh, find from here, actually part of speech information, is better than using all the features because <laughs> All the features introduce a little bit of noise into the classification. So overall, the takeaway here is that if you can identify the part of speech of the missing word, and this is even true if you look at the uh, part of speech of the error word in the machine, in the speech recognition, uh, you can pretty much figure out what people would do in that situation. Would they stop and ask a clarification question, or would they just continue on without bothering to ask a clarification question? So I'm going to, not sure how much time I have left here, about 15 minutes. We've done some work on identifying local errors, which I'll talk about pretty quickly. Uh, the goal here was to try to figure out which words are actually misrecognized in an utterance which is, has some recognition errors. Um, so basically, what we do in the actual system is we use AMUs, um, error detection information, um, instead of uh, what we've been working on because um, trying to fit into the larger system, and we really have focused on identifying which words rather than which segments are misrecognized. But I'll tell you a little bit about our experiments on word at the word level. So we did experiments first at the utterance level and also at the word level to try to figure out what sort of features can you use to identify um, ASR errors beyond using ASR confidence scores. And the baseline is just using ASR confidence scores. So can we improve over this using prosodic and other maybe discourse level information? Um, these are the features that we found to be the best predictors at the utterance level. So if you want to do a little bit better than a speech recognizer typically does, what can you do? Um, so we looked at, we did use the confidence score, but we also looked at the average word length in the utterance, the utterance length, um, the utterance location within the corpus, um, and some part of speech information, and a ratio of function words to total words in the utterance. And for word level features, our best features were too long to read out to you, but if you're interested, you can look at this. But again, they're durational features, they're locational features, and they're part of speech features. And unfortunately, for people who are interested in prosody, we found that these kinds of features were much more effective than the prosodic features that we use. We were very discouraged about this, but nonetheless, you have to accept the results you get. Uh, these were features that didn't turn out to be very useful and they're more interesting ones like syntactic features, dependency tags, <laughs> prosodic features, semantic information, all this good stuff. I'm sorry, it just didn't, didn't help us. We don't give up, but... And here's our performance. Oops, well, here's just a, a description, quick description of the way what we did. So we did two kinds of experiments. Either we tried to identify the misrecognized words directly, just one stage, or we tried a two-stage approach. First we would identify, we would try to figure out, is there an error anywhere in this utterance? And then at the second stage, we would try to figure out if we have decided there's an error somewhere, where is it? And we did some upsampling and down, of our data because the um, data was skewed toward recognition accuracy. So most of the words were, the majority of the words were recognized correctly, so we did some upsampling to counter that. And here are the results. As you see, recall is best in our two-stage approach 
but precision is best in, um, sorry, <laughs> got to read my own. Yeah, so um, recall is best in this one stage approach where we directly identify which words are misrecognized and precision is best in the two stage approach. Now, if you're going to ask a targeted <coughs> clarification question, which is more important, precision or recall? Any ideas? <laughs> the only two choices. You can probably, pretty good chance of being right. I don't know, what would you say? I'd say precision. I'd say precision too. <laughs> yeah, it's, if you're, you know, trying to be a model human-like behavior, it's really good if you can, you know, if you are correct about what word has been misrecognized and you uh, don't convey to the user that you have correctly recognized a whole bunch of words that are not correct. So I think precision is better. So that gives us an idea of which one of these we would use. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it de definitely depends on the application. And um, for this application, we were trying not to annoy the user too much and not to ask too many useless questions. I think we want to go for precision, but it all depends on what your goal is. Okay, so we've done a little bit of word on predicting the error type, and all I'll say about it is that this is work um, in progress. Um, we're trying to decide if a simple decision is that a function or content word isn't so difficult, but if it's a function word, what function word is it? Is turning out to be a lot more difficult. We have done some work trying to classify um, preposition detection. That is, is the missing word a preposition? And if so, what sort of preposition? And our F measure is not very high. It's only about 72%. There are a lot of prepositions that it could be and it's very hard to, to figure out which one it is. But we're not too bad at identifying that it is a preposition since it's a closed set. So in summary, what we want to do is improve the humanness of communication in a spoken dialogue system. So we collected a bunch of data. We gave people an error situation and asked them, how would you address this error as a human being? But uh, we've discovered some features that can predict the basic behavior, would they stop and ask a question or not? And if they stop and ask a question, what type of question would they ask? We've done some work on localizing these likely ASR errors, and we've done a little bit of work on trying to figure out more precisely if people are you know, going to just go on without asking a question, what type of error it is and how we could fill in the missing information. So the future directions that we're working on now with more experiments, um, can we automatically detect and correct the kinds of errors that two-thirds of the time people seem to at least think they can do? Um, can we, just, and this is one that's really cool, can we figure out when the system has asked the wrong question? That is, one of our clever clarification targeted questions that turns out to be wrong in some way, that's just not appropriate. Or uh, sometimes, we ask <laughs> sometimes we ask people um, when the missing word is the proper name and we don't correctly, someone doesn't correctly, <laughs> not us, doesn't correctly recognize that it's a proper name, and you say, I'm sorry, I don't, didn't understand X, the proper name, could you please rephrase that? That's really hard for people to do. <laughs> so we've actually done a lot of experiments where we ask questions like this and we see what's the difference in the behavior of the respondent when you ask something or you ask them to spell something that's like, I don't know, 10 words long. <laughs> So mostly they just say, no, are you kidding? 
So we want to be able to detect that behavior automatically so that we can fall back to maybe a better, more generic type strategy when that happens, or perhaps apologize. And also, the third question that we're looking at now is, when should a system stop trying to clarify? When should it just say, do you want to start over? Or maybe shall we go on to another topic? Um, <laughs> again, we're, we're doing experiments with human beings to see what kind of tolerance they have for our continual questions. Uh, and again, I'd like to just acknowledge um, the Columbia people who have been working on this. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. And if so, could it be a targeted clarification <laughs> question? <laughs> yes. So I was wondering, you showed me the experiments that you had uh, around the 60s and 70s. Uh, there were no questions asked by the uh, people, people. Uh, and the 38 of them were. Mm -hmm. uh, you were surprised by uh, the very low number of uh, questions that were asked. <coughs> it was written, yes. And there was no face to face communication. Yep. So there was not really any engagement or need for them to understand. Do you think that might have played a role? Of course. Um, with uh, crowdsourcing, you never know how totally engaged your people were. Um, what we had hoped for was that um, at least one of them in each case would be engaged enough to ask a question, if, if a question did seem to be needed. And I think the results suggest that they, what they were doing was pretty sensible. In most cases, when they didn't ask a question, you could sort of understand why they didn't ask a question. So, <laughs> but I, I agree with you. I think we had considered doing lots more, asking lots more Turkers to do the same thing. Um, but at the moment, we're just moving on because I think the results we got were, you know, they're reasonable after the fact. It's just that we hadn't anticipated that kind of behavior. Yeah, Chris. Uh, along that same lines, have you considered a follow up question when the Turkers say, I won't ask clarification questions, but then ask them what they would do to see whether you get consistency in the response? Because, you know, we're assuming, of course, that, that humans will have will do this. You know, we'll react appropriately to the case and be correct, and you know it's not true. So if you discover that in response to the car question, they all say close the door, good. But if they say all kinds of things, then we know that the human system has also got some error in it. Yeah, um, there were cases of where, like the person who thought that the missing word was a pronoun, that just seemed wildly different. From, but for each of the questions we looked at, at least one person seemed to be behaving you know, pretty reasonably. So, um, yeah, if we could have asked a follow-up question. I don't know if we would have asked, what would you do? I think what we should have, well, but we had asked them what they thought the word was. Mm -hmm. And in cases where they thought they knew what the word was, they didn't ask a question. So it was always in cases where they didn't, they didn't hypothesize a word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that one. Even if the answer at output is perfectly clarified, there might remain ambiguities at the input of the IT system because the variable is speech translation, right? So in like your work which is unknown to the IT system, it would be maybe useful to give this sub-dialogue for disambiguation of the input input. Yes, absolutely. And the early parts of the evaluation did actually induce those ambiguity errors as possibilities, so the dialogue manager does <laughs> does handle those. Unfortunately, um, a decision was made to only propose two possible uh, senses of ambiguous words. And when you ask a person, did you mean, you know, uh, what would be right as in correct or right as in um, direction, but in fact, it was R-I-T-E, which is right as in ritual. <laughs> that was another case of an inappropriate question, and that's one of the things we're testing now. What, do you, what does a person 
say or do to indicate that you know, you've asked only really the wrong question like that. You've given them too few choices. Of course, most words have lots of parts of speech, so you don't want to ask every possible sense of the word. But that's why we want to be able to detect those cases, because if it was something like that, we would know, oh, probably you know, our inappropriate question didn't include the right word sense. So we could ask more word senses. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering about the word of action. Yeah. They, they wouldn't ask the question when the word of action was missing. And I was wondering if it was, if it was really the case for all situations in which you had the verb of action. Did they guess the right one? Yes, because it's uh, uh, working on um, working and not it playing the piano. It's all collocation of information. Well, playing the piano did not occur. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I> know, okay. <laughs> yes. I, I was wondering what, if you have an example in which you use a verb of action with a colloquy that's unusual, would they recognize the word? Yes, we didn't look at that particular question. We did look at which verbs of action they felt they did not have to ask questions about. That was mostly simple things like go. Um, can you remember any others? Yeah. That's the one that springs to mind. So the <coughs> verbs used in this, these dialogues were pretty simple ones. Go, I think it was mostly go. I'll have to look back. but. Yeah, it was surprising enough so that you know we did look at which verbs, and there were very there were a few verbs that were used a lot. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, I was wondering about the matching between the circus and the dialogues themselves, because the examples that you played us to me sounded very interesting. So <laughs> yes, well, supply, yes, that's true. Bring the supplies to a particular place. If the circus had been in the military, they would have guessed much more yes. than the... Uh, we should have asked them if they had been in... Yeah. You know, the vehicle, the vehicle, the right. gate. I imagine that's uh, what I'm saying. Yes, I do. You're quite right. Uh, these are very eccentric dialogues. Um, <laughs> well, yes, by military circus. Yes, that's true. Um, we didn't ask them whether they had any military background. I don't know if they would have told us truthfully. You never know. Um, but we probably should have asked them. That's a very good point. Okay. Yes. Uh, I had a comment uh, about uh, the action of verbs. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it is actually, well, it seems surprising. But if you think at languages like German, where you have um, very often long sentences with the action verb really at the end of the sentence, mm -hmm. You, you have languages where you have this um, uh, the, the verb which is not solved and you can handle everything which is coming mm -hmm. and the verb is coming at the end and there is no problem. So this goes in, in favor of what you observe. That's that, true. Mm -hmm. That the uh, action verb is not so, so much a problem. Yeah, we don't have verbs. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had an, uh, another question. I don't know what I have followed correctly. So uh, you, you gave the, the written version to, to the people, mm -hmm. and there were XXX when there was I'm supposed to be uh, one word error or an error region without specifying the number of words? Uh, we didn't specify that multiple words were missing. We just said XXX, and they had to decide whether it was a multi-word error or a single word error. They had a lot more trouble with multi-word yes. errors, and not surprising. And did, did you put more Xs when no. there were um, no. uh, longer durations? No. Because this is what, uh, when, when we listen to something and we don't get a portion, we know more or less the duration of the... the you could figure it out. Yeah. No, we didn't give them that information. We just said there's a missing word here. Because mm -hmm. often in a recognition, <coughs> we don't know if it's multiple words that have been misrecognized or a yes. single word. Yes, but we know the, the duration. We didn't give them the duration. Mm -hmm. But usually the multi-word errors were just a couple of words in the data that we gave them. Yeah, Sarah? Um, I'm interested in whether you would do any sort of cluster analysis of how those code varies in 
and I like the particular use of democratic in getting nothing much for property. It should be co-varying with, with your parts of speech and, and so on, and it might help focus down a little bit. Yeah, no, we didn't do that. Yes. What can we do with sentences where there are multiple errors in uh, different locations? Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> um, those are really hard. <laughs> That's why you asked the question. I know. No, that remains to be seen. I don't know. Because you don't know which to ask about first. I guess, I mean, a clever person could, what did you do what with? But, yeah. So we haven't done that yet. Time is probably over. <laughs>